So a few announcements for us this morning. Uh, thank you for giving, you know, to us as a church, but I also just want to say thank you for giving to the Great Commission Fund. The two international speakers, international workers that we had the last two weeks are supported through the Christian Missionary Alliance by a fund called the Great Commission Fund. And the CMA does it differently than other denominations. They just say, hey, we're a family, let's give towards, you know, a fund, and then from that fund, let's send people out so that workers don't have to, like, feel the burden of raising their own support. So that's, that's how we do that as a, as a denomination. If you want to give specifically to the Great Commission Fund, you can do it through these four ways that you'd normally give to our church. Just mark that it's for the Great Commission Fund so that you know that that's where your money is going. Uh, two things for the men of our church. There's a men's ministry meeting tonight in the fireside room. Gary Coles is talking about walking with Christ through his word. So come to that, all men in our church. And also there is a men's retreat coming up in two weeks with a speaker, Tony Miles. He's a pastor. He's an adjunct professor at Crown College. Uh, we think he's going to be bringing some, some good stuff to men's retreat. One disclaimer for this. This is probably the cheapest men's retreat you will ever go to. I'm being completely honest. It's 60 bucks for, for adults, and it's half price for college students, which is $30. And I wanted to figure this out, but you probably can't go and eat at McDonald's like Friday night through Sunday morning. And, you know, you spend more than that. So cheapest, cheapest men's retreat we've had. Part of that's because men in our church uh, did an event last year and raised some support to kind of help uh, offset the cost for guys in our church. So it's a good thing. One thing with that, though, there is a hard deadline on this for today. So I know we, we sit on the fence as a church, you know, and we sign up last minute. We have to make a call on the camp today if we're going to have it. So if you've been sitting on the fence, please sign up because tonight our uh, men's leadership team needs to make a call on whether we continue with the retreat or not based on signups. So a few other retreat notices. If you're a high schooler, you probably have been hearing, hearing about this fall retreat. Because of what's going on with Pastor Kyle, we're just going to bump that back to November 6th and 7th. So mark your calendars there. And uh, next weekend on the 18th, we're going to have a night of prayer and worship specifically for our nation. Just thinking with the election coming up, just praying, lifting that up to the Lord, lifting our nation up to the Lord. So feel, feel free to come to that. Last, we've got a video. You may have seen this last Sunday, but we're going to watch it one more time from Ryan, one of our deacons. Hey, Mac family. It's Ryan Martin, one of the deacons here at Menominee Alliance Church. I need your help with something. It's that time of year for our Coats for Kids drive. Our Coats for Kids drive is where we ask for donations of new winter coats and other winter clothing items for students in need throughout the Menominee Area School District. If you don't remember from last year, we were able to give a bag of clothing to every school throughout the district. We collect over 100 items in total. So between now and Sunday, October 25th, you can get those donations right back here to Menominee Alliance Church. Starting next week, we'll have a big wrap box out in the foyer for you to drop those donations in. I just want to say thank you ahead of time for helping me and the rest of our church family keep the students of Menominee warm this winter. Have a good afternoon, and I hope to see you soon. All right, let's stand together and pray as we begin. Lord, we lift up all of these different events going on in our church. Uh, we don't want to do events for the sake of events, but we pray that you would be moving in the midst of every single one of them. We do lift up the women of our church this morning who are at a women's retreat. As they're wrapping up their time this morning, we pray that you would bless them with your presence, Lord, that you'd be speaking to them, that you'd be showing them things that refresh them, and things that they can apply to their lives when they come back from retreat. Lord, we lift up these men's ministry things going on in our church. We just pray that in the midst of those, that you'd be building up the men of our church. Show us how to lead. Show us how to be like Jesus, Lord, as you've called us to be in your word. And uh, we just lift up to you also this Coats for Kids drive that we just talked about. We thank you, Lord, for Ryan, for the deacons of our ministry that are they're trying to use this to push us outward and show us that there are people in our community that can't even afford, you know, coats and stuff for their kids. So, Lord, help us to bless those people in your name. We come before you now. We lift up these songs because you are worthy. Lord, we praise you for the season, for the colors that have been changing around us, for just the beauty of your creation. And we know that all of that is supposed to point us to you. So, Lord, may we take everything that we've seen this week in your creation and turn it into praise this morning. We lift it up in your name. Amen. Creations 
to trust you more this morning as we prepare our hearts for the message we pray that you'd be speaking through pastor james would you help us to receive the word that you have for us this morning and would you help us to trust you more and, and act upon that trust in obedience and the way that we live we pray in jesus name amen Let's pray this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We come before you and we worship you this morning. Father, how good it is to be in your presence. And we, we come and we, we pray for Pastor Kyle and Stacy this morning. Lord, what a whirlwind they have experienced the last few weeks. We thank you, Father, that your hand has been upon Stacy. We thank you for a successful surgery. We thank you, Father, that this tumor was not cancerous. And we come and we pray that you would bring complete healing to her. That, Lord, as she is in the hospital recovering from this extensive surgery, we pray, Father, that your peace and your presence would be made known to her. That Pastor Kyle would experience that same peace, the peace that passes all understanding. And Father, we pray for the pain. We pray that, Father, you would bring relief from the discomfort and the pain that she is experiencing. Father, we look forward to having them join us once again for worship and being an active part of our congregation. And Lord, we just pray that we would look for ways to encourage and continue to lift them up in prayer. Father, we pray this morning as we open your word that we would... Just be in awe of who you are. That you would speak to us. That we would know your presence is with us. That we would be challenged and transformed because we've had an encounter with Jesus this morning. Expand our horizons. Help us to look beyond ourselves. Help us to see the world as you see the world, Jesus. Give us a heart and a passion for pursuing the lost and proclaiming the gospel of Jesus to those around us. Spirit, we pray that any distraction, any hindrance, anything that would keep us from meeting and hearing Jesus this morning would just be eliminated. We ask all this in the strong and precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray and all God's people said. Well, you get to hear me for the next couple of weeks. I know it was a great break the last few weeks hearing from international workers, but it's me again. So uh, it's good to be back. Um, I've, I enjoyed the last two Sundays. I don't know about you, but hearing from our international workers who are on the front lines, who are engaged in completing the Great Commission. Uh, we can't say much about what we experienced the last two weeks this morning because we're live streaming and we want to welcome our live streamers back. Thanks for joining us this morning. But it was an incredible experience for me. I hope it was for you as well to hear what God is doing in some of the darkest regions of our world where God is working and moving and drawing people to himself. And uh, as we experienced the last two Sundays hearing from those that are involved in reaching some of the, the most unreached people groups around the world. The rest of October, we're going to continue our theme of unfinished. God has given us a task to do, but yet it remains unfinished. 
It remains unfinished. Unfinished can be defined as not brought to an end or the desired final state. Our work, church, is unfinished. The task that Jesus gave to us to go and make disciples of all nations has not yet been completed. The work is unfinished. The founder of the Christian Missionary Alliance, A.B. Simpson, said, uh, and this quote's going to be up on the screen for you, he says, we need to finish our unfinished work. We need to do the things that we have thought of doing, intended to do, things that we have talked about doing and are abundantly able to do. We need to finish our unfinished work. There are things that we as a church, we've thought of doing. We've thought of doing certain things to advance the gospel. We've intended to do things. We've talked about it, and church, if we're honest, we are abundantly able to do many of those things. And yet the work is still unfinished. We need to do those things. We need to finish our unfinished work. Friends, Jesus has given us a mission. He's given us an important task, one of the most important tasks that the church could ever have. One that when we understand it, when we embrace it, when we undertake it, it radically glorifies Jesus. And it calls the world to come and see who he is as well. Open your Bibles. We're going to be in Acts this morning. We're going to jump off in the very first chapter, one of the first few verses, and then we're going to jump to chapter 16. But in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Luke records for us these words of Jesus. Jesus is ready to ascend. He is ascending into heaven after his resurrection. And he says, but you will receive, and he's speaking to the disciples, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. The task that we have been given, the task that we have been commanded to complete still remains unfinished. The work still remains. And I think part of the reason that our work is unfinished is because you and I are on, on unfinished journeys as well. God is revealing his heart. He is empowering us by his spirit. He is equipping us. As his people and he is building his church and so we pray together we invite God into our unfinished journeys we allow him to mold us into his son's likeness we ask him to help us see the world through his eyes and as we grow in our understanding and knowledge of who Jesus is of how deeply Jesus loves us and what great lengths Jesus has gone to to bring all peoples to himself our journeys will start to converge with his heart for the world. And so we seek the Spirit's presence. We seek his power. We seek his guidance to walk with him in the journey that he has laid before us. But how do we reconcile what God has called his followers to do with the church some 2,000 years later? Jesus, as he was ascending into heaven, said, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses everywhere to the very ends of the earth. How do we get back to that place? To do what God has called us to do. To do what God has empowered us to do. And when we talk of unfinished, we must remember that first and foremost, it is God who calls us to complete his mission. He is the one that calls us. He is the one that equips us. He is the one that empowers us to accomplish the task before us. I want us to look at three attitudes or things that we need to consider as we look at the task that God has given us. And the first one is this. We need to surrender to the Spirit. We need to surrender to the Spirit. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, that first verse that we looked at, we witnessed Jesus telling his disciples that they would be his witnesses to the entire world. They had been given the mission, and yet the very next words of the Savior must have been surprising. If you go back to Acts chapter 1, verse 8, and read the following verses, Jesus tells them exactly what they're to do. He tells them that the Holy Spirit will come upon them, they, he will empower them, and they will be his witnesses. But the first thing he says is to wait. 
seems a little perplexing. Jesus has given them the mission. He said the Holy Spirit would empower them to do it, give them power to be his witnesses. And for many of this, this doesn't sound, for many of us, this doesn't sound like good advice. It seems almost counterintuitive. God, you have given us this seemingly impossible task to go and share the good news through the whole world, and yet you've told us to wait. Jesus, there's a lost and dying world that desperately needs to know the good news, to know who you are and what you've done, and yet you're telling the disciples to wait. But there's a significance to Jesus' words. He's called the disciples to a mission, a seemingly impossible mission, but he's given them two rock-solid promises. And the first is this, that the Holy Spirit would empower. The Holy Spirit would empower them to do the mission. And the second is this, the second promise Jesus gives them is that the mission would be accomplished. It will come to be completed someday. Friends, I want us to recognize and understand fully that the Great Commission, what Jesus has called the church to do, will never be accomplished by mere human strength or human effort or through wise planning or amazing strategy. Although those things are important, those are important in completing the task, we must recognize that we cannot do what God has called us to do. We can't carry the gospel to the ends of the earth without the empowerment of the Spirit. We can't do it apart from the Holy Spirit. Only God brings about the transformation of moving someone from spiritual darkness to spiritual light, transforming sinners into saints. And before moving out and making disciples in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth, the disciples waited until they were empowered by the Holy Spirit. And our journey with Jesus and participation in his great commission will always remain unfinished if we don't first surrender. Surrender to the Spirit brings the empowerment needed to accomplish the task that God has given us to undertake. <coughs> Paul, one of the greatest missionaries the world has ever encountered, knew what it meant to surrender to the Spirit. His life was a testimony of transformation, a powerful testimony of what happens when one encounters the living Savior and surrenders his or her life to Jesus. Paul was a testimony of radical life transformation. Go ahead in your Bibles and flip to Acts chapter 16. We're going to look at Acts chapter 16 this morning, and we're going to see Paul and Silas and Timothy and Luke, Luke who is writing Acts, they're on a journey to spread the gospel, to fulfill the great commission that Jesus had given the disciples and given us. And one of the first things we look at when we look at Paul, we see radical life transformation, but we also see surrender to the spirit. Let's look at verses six through 10. Paul and his companions, Luke's writing here, Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. When they came to the border of Mesia, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. So they passed by Mesia and went down to Troas. During the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, come, come over to Macedonia and help us. And after Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God has called us to preach the gospel to them. When we look at this passage, these, this short passage, verses 6 through 10, we see Paul and his companions have two attempts. They've tried two times to enter into new areas to preach the gospel, only to be prompted by the Holy Spirit to go in a completely different direction. Paul wanted to preach the word in the province of Asia. He tried to enter, and yet the Holy Spirit kept him from preaching the word in the province of Asia. So he wants to enter into Asia, but the Holy Spirit guides him and prompts him to go to a different area. He then tries to enter into the region of Bithynia, only to find that circumstances prevented him from entering. And Luke records that the spirit of Jesus would not allow them to enter. We may look at that and say, God, you've called us to proclaim the gospel. Why would you keep us from going into regions beyond, regions where no one has yet heard? 
We don't know the situations and the circumstances. Paul could have been warned in a dream. He could have been warned by other believers. He could have experienced great physical uh, danger to himself. He could have faced political unrest in the area. For whatever reason, the Spirit of God kept pushing Paul in a new direction. And when Paul wanted to go one way, the Holy Spirit said, no, this is the direction you're going to go. And this happened two times. Two times that Paul tried to go a certain direction. And he concluded, I will go where you want me to go, Father. I will go where the Spirit leads. And as Paul sleeps one night, he has this vision. He has this vision of a man from Macedonia, a place where not, no one knows Jesus, a place that had not heard of the gospel. There was no gospel access in this region. And Paul sees a vision of a man from Macedonia crying out to him, begging him to come and to help. And when Paul comes out of this vision, when he wakes up, he shares with his companions what God is doing and, and what he had seen and this man calling for help. And Luke says, we concluded that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. And so we went. Church, that does not happen unless you first surrender to the spirit. And Paul surrendered to the spirit. I mean, everything, Paul surrendered. He waited on the Holy Spirit. He sought the Spirit's presence, his power, and his guidance to walk with them the path that God had chosen for them. And the Spirit gives a vision of a man from Macedonia crying out for help. Church, here's the important application part for us. We must surrender to the Spirit of God. God has freely given us the Spirit. He's empowered us. He's equipped us. And he's going on ahead of us. And as followers of Jesus... We cannot complete the great commission of making disciples here in Menominee, here, there, and everywhere, apart from the indwelling, supernatural empowerment of the Holy Spirit. Church, we cannot make disciples apart from surrender to the Spirit. We cannot forge ahead on the path without the Holy Spirit. We can't do anything, we can't do any ministry that equips and builds up the church, that wins people to Jesus Christ, unless we first surrender to the Spirit. Let's look at the testimony of the transformed. The second thing that we're going to look at is the testimony of the transformed. In, Luke, uh, in Acts chapter 16, Luke provides for us, as we dig into the rest of this chapter, he provides for us three accounts. Three accounts of these encounters of people whose lives were radically transformed. And we see their testimonies. These are three individuals from the city of Philippi, which just so happened to be in Macedonia. As Paul receives this vision of a man from Macedonia, Luke and the team conclude that God is leading them to this location. And Paul has an encounter, and his colleagues have an encounter with three individuals whose lives were about to be radically changed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, when Paul would enter into a new city, he would often go to the synagogue to preach. He would go to the synagogue, he would meet with the Jewish people. Some of them believed the message. Others only, they, they looked at Jesus as, as a, an unknown, kind of like what we looked at in, in Come and See series. Some people believed in Jesus, some did not. But Paul would go to the synagogues to reach his own people first. There's no indication that there's a synagogue in Philippi because Paul doesn't go to one. Rather, he goes down. Let's look at verses 13 through 15. On the Sabbath, we went outside the city gate to the river where we expected to find a place of prayer. Paul is going and looking for Jewish people to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. So we go down to outside the city gate to the river where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and began to speak to women who had gathered there. One of those listening was a woman named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth from the city of Thyatira, who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. And when she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us in her home. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us. You see, Paul... Silas, Timothy, and Luke all sat down and started to speak with the women that were gathered by the river who were there to pray. They started to speak to them the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
And one of these women who was there, Lydia, came to believe in Jesus through Paul's message. The Lord opened her heart. She responded to the gospel. And it doesn't just indicate that it was just her who responded, but her whole household. Because they're all followers of Jesus and they all are baptized. And she invites Paul and his colleagues to come and stay. It's the first encounter. The second encounter is of a demonically oppressed slave. A demonically possessed slave girl. Let's look at verses 16 through 18. Paul, Silas, Timothy, and Luke are continuing to go to this place of prayer to preach. Once when we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune telling. This girl followed Paul and the rest of us shouting, These men are servants of the Most High God who are telling you the way to be saved. She kept us up for many days. Finally, Paul became so troubled that he turned around and said to the spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. And at that moment, the spirit left her. I want you to, to, to just picture this encounter for a minute. Paul, Silas, Timothy, and Lou are traveling down to the river almost on a daily basis. And there's a girl who is possessed by a demon. And she sees these men, she hears their message, and the demon recognizes that they are preaching in the name of Jesus. And the demon is freely speaking through her. And in many ways is a witness to what Jesus is doing. She's speaking and it's bothering Paul. I mean, if someone went around following me every single time, telling everyone what I was doing, I would become frustrated too. It was a distraction. It was distracting the people from Paul's message. And Paul becomes so troubled that he finally turns and speaks to the demon, to the spirit, and says, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. And at that very moment, the spirit left. Now, when the spirit left the slave girl, so did her ability to tell the future, her fortune telling. She was being used by her slave masters, by her masters to earn a, a lucrative business. She was telling people their future, whether or not it was true. But when the spirit left her and she was set free, she no longer had the ability to make money for her masters. And it caused quite an uproar. If you would go through Acts chapter 16 and read the rest of it, Paul and Silas are brought before the local authorities they were accused of stirring up the crowds, of, of leading them astray from uh, the Greek religions and the Greek teachers and the Greek mythology. And they're beaten. And they're thrown into prison. They're placed in an inner cell and their feet are fastened with stocks. There's no escaping. And yet, in the middle of that situation, songs of joy and prayers to God reverberated through the dark, damp prison cell. And all ears were attentive to the voice of these two men as they prayed and worshiped God that they were worthy to be followers of Jesus. And through this encounter, we have the third, the third incredible encounter that Paul and Silas were about to have would be with their Philippian jailer. Let's look at verses 25 through 34. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the other, other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was such a, a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. All at once, the prison doors flew open and everybody's chains came loose. The jailer woke up and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew a sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. Here's this jailer recognizing that he is a Roman citizen. He was probably a former Roman soldier. He had to protect the jail. He couldn't allow any prisoner to escape. And if the prisoners escape, his life was on the line. And so he sees that this earthquake has just decimated his jail. The walls have all caved in. The prisoners' chains have come off. And he thinks that they have all escaped. So he's ready to kill himself. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself. We are all here. We are all here. The jailer called for lights, rushed in, and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? 
They replied, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. They spoke the word of the Lord to him and all the others in his house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately he and his family, all his family were baptized. The jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole family. In all three of these instances, we see the testimony of the transformed. Their lives had been radically changed because they had encountered Jesus. And yet none of this would have happened had not Paul and Silas and Timothy and Luke willingly and completely surrendered to the leading of the Holy Spirit. They invited God into their own unfinished journeys. They allowed him to mold them and to shape them into his son's likeness. They asked him to help them see the world through his eyes. And lives were changed. Lives were changed for all eternity because these men had captured a glimpse of God's heart for the world. Their hearts were burdened to proclaim Jesus to those who had not yet heard his name. We've got to surrender to the Spirit, church. We have to surrender to the Spirit, and when we surrender to the Spirit, we will see and hear the testimony of transformed lives. But the third thing is we've got to play, your, we've got to play our part. Church, you have to play your part. It's important that we are playing each of our own parts. And these three encounters with people in Philippi were not the end of the story. You see, this is just the starting point. Years later, Paul would address the church in Philippi. He would write to them. And I want us to flip over to Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1, verses 3 through 6. Paul is writing to the church in Philippi. And he says, I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Paul is addressing the church in Philippi. On that very first journey into Philippi, there was no church. And yet he had three encounters with these individuals, with Lydia and the women at the river, with the demon-possessed girl, with the Philippian jailer. And through those encounters, lives were radically transformed. And now Paul is addressing a church that is there. He's writing to an established church, a gathering of believers who are faithfully proclaiming Jesus in their city. They've come full circle. They're giving, they're supporting, they're praying, they're proclaiming so the gospel of Jesus could reach to those who have not yet heard. And the early church in Philippi had a part to play in working toward completing the unfinished work. In church, so do we. We have a part to play in completing the unfinished work that God has given to us. Our church, Menominee Alliance Church, has a part to play in completing the unfinished work. Our journey remains unfinished, but God has asked us to be active participants in the work. The mission didn't end with Jesus ascending into heaven. It didn't end with him telling the disciples to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. It didn't end before the gospel reached us. It hasn't ended for those that are still lacking gospel access. And it will not end until all peoples have had an opportunity to hear and to respond to the gospel of Jesus Christ. The Joshua Project is a great resource if you want to look at gospel access in the Great Commission around the world. The the, the JoshuaProject.net. I want to put up a slide here for us this morning that talks about all people groups across the world by reaching this status. There are over 17,400 different people groups around the world. I want you to think about that for a moment. Over 17,442 people groups all around the world. Of those 17,442 people groups, 
only 3,200 have been significantly reached with the gospel of Jesus Christ. While over 7,400, 7,400 people groups have never heard the name of Jesus. Of those 7,400 people groups, it represents over 3.23 billion people who have never heard of the name of Jesus. Almost 42% of the world's population is in an unreached people's group who if they were to die at this very moment, would spend an eternity apart from Jesus. The mission did not end with Jesus ascending into heaven. It did not end with the disciples taking the good news to the very furthest reaches of the world. The mission did not end when you received the gospel yourself. The mission does not end. It remains unfinished, church. And it will not be completed until every people group has heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. And they've had an opportunity to respond. Do you want to know when the end will come? Matthew 24, 14 says, This gospel of the kingdom will be preached to the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. Church, there is no denying that the task before us is overwhelming. There is no denying that there are many who have still not heard. And your life is too small if it is not connected to the great commission of Jesus. Not all of us may be called to be full-time missionaries overseas. But we are all called to care about the mission of Jesus. We cannot continue to neglect the clear call of our Savior to reach our world. We can't focus on what God has called us to do just one or two times per year. We must make it our priority. God's heart beats for the nations. His desire is that all peoples worship Him and be with Him for eternity. And as a follower of Jesus, your heart and my heart should be the same as our Heavenly Father. John, in writing to the church in Revelation, said this. After this, I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, from every tribe, from every people and language, standing before the throne and in front of the Lamb. And what were they doing? They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands, and they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation! belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. John got a glimpse of the future, of the mission that is finished and complete. Because all around the throne, all around the throne were people from every nation, from every tribe, from every language, from every people standing before the throne, worshiping Jesus forever and ever and ever. Church, the mission before us may seem impossible, but it will be complete one day. God uses the church to get the gospel to the nations, and he uses the gospel unity of the church to draw the nations to Jesus. This is our mission, and it remains unfinished. So how do we apply this? I want to ask you a few questions as we close, as the worship team comes forward. I want you to just go ahead and bow your head, close your eyes, and I want you to just think about these things. God's heart is for the world. And as we become more like Jesus, our heart should be burdened for the world as well. So I want you to ask yourself this question, what may be keeping me from having a heart for missions in the world? God, what is keeping me from having the same heart that you have for the world? And I want you to pray right now that God would give you that heart because that's his heart. 
And as we become more like Jesus, as we surrender to the Spirit, as we hear testimonies of the transformed, as we start to play our part, God will give each one of us, I firmly believe it, He will give us a heart for the world. And in what ways can you partner in the gospel of Jesus Christ? How can you as an individual, how can you as a family, how can we as a church family partner with what God is doing around the world? What are ways that we can play our part? What would the result be if we wholeheartedly partnered together to complete Jesus' great commission? Church, that should be our sole focus. Above everything else that we do in this world, our sole focus should be proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ everywhere we go so that the world may know in what way or ways is your story still an unfinished journey? As followers of Jesus, your life, your heart, your passion, your desire should be the same as that of Jesus Christ. How well do these things line up with Jesus? How well do these things line up with Jesus? Church, we're on an unfinished journey. There's a mission that Jesus has given to us. And time is short. The mission seems impossible. It seems beyond our reach. And it is when we try to do it on our own. But when we surrender as a body, as a family, as a church, to what the Spirit has for us, I firmly believe that we will see the work go from unfinished to finished for the glory of God. Jesus, we thank you for this day. We pray that you would continue to speak to our hearts, that you would give us a heart for the world. Because that's your heart. You have called us as your body to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. Father, forgive us for the times that we've lost sight of the mission that you've called us to. Father, forgive us for focusing on things that will not matter in eternity. And Father, we pray that you would renew our heart and renew our passion to proclaim Jesus to the world. Here, there, and everywhere. And we thank you that that work will be complete someday. But give us an urgency to see it completed as soon as possible. We ask this in the strong and precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. 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 Let's stand together. Close the song.
today, would you bring deeper conviction on each of our lives, Lord, of, of your unfinished mission and how we are to be a part of it. We just pray this in Jesus' name as we go. Amen. Amen. Have God bless. Have a good week. If any of you would like prayer, I'll let there will be people up front to pray with you.